I'm trying to uh, talk very briefly on the role of stem cell transplantation in multiple myeloma. So I'm gonna focus on autologous transplant because that is the standard of care for treatment for transplant eligible patients. So as um, uh, both of the speakers have uh, mentioned briefly on the, uh, on the myeloma disease, uh, it is about uh, you know, rare cancer, about 1% of all cancers and about 10% of all blood cancers. This is the estimate of the American Cancer Society for 2020, 32,270 new cases um, uh, for 2020. And out of that, about 13,000 expected deaths. It's a disease of the elderly. Uh, so median age is about 65 plus years. Uh, but having said that, uh, all of us who are seeing myeloma patients day in and out, we're seeing very young patients as well. The, the youngest patient I have is about 30 year old, very unfortunately um, patient. And it occurs in all races, but as Dr. Callender said, it is twice more common in African Americans um, than Caucasians, and there might be some genetic uh, influence there. Uh, the study is uh, ongoing for that. So uh, both of the speakers said um, uh, beautifully about the, the milestones that we have achieved in the uh, treatment paradigm in my, multiple myeloma, leading to um, tripling of the survival that, uh, than what it was about 20 years ago. So uh, the first treatment, that systematic treatment started in 1960s with the introduction of oral melphalan and prednisone. And you can see uh, in the figure, um, the high-dose therapy or high-dose therapy um, or high-dose melphalan, which is a part of the autologous stem cell transplant started in 1980s. That time it, it was started without any stem cell support. And then later on the stem, stem cell support was given and the first randomized trial to, to establish the benefit of the high-dose therapy followed by autologous stem cell rescue was done by French group in 1996, leading and uh, that led to uh, that showed that the uh, high dose therapy followed by transplant was associated with the um, progression for survival and overall survival than the conventional therapy. Now, as you all know, the novel agents that started in early 2000 with the introduction of a drug like thalidomide and its analogs, and since that time, we have achieved a lot of success in myeloma therapy with the introduction of the protein inhibitors, second generation imids, and in the last five years, the introduction of the monoclonal antibodies. So as you can see, this uh, introduction of several therapies have increased the survival quite a bit, but uh, the, the role of stem cell transplant still remains uh, very strong. Even with the introduction of all those therapies, uh, the transplant still remains a very important therapy for the eligible patients. So what is stem cell transplant? Actually, when I tell my patients, uh, it is not a transplant per se that you are getting transplant from somebody else when you're talking about autologous transplant. So it, it is nothing but uh, it is basically a stem cell rescue. So what we're doing, this is the several steps involved in the uh, process of the stem cell transplant. The first step is the collection of the stem cells. These are the stem cells that go on and multiply to become a good cells like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets that are needed for the survival of your body. So we take those stem cells and then we collect and process them and we put them in a the freezer. So when you put them in the freezer, we can be used any point of time later on. And once after that process is done, we give a very high dose of chemotherapy and the standard of chemotherapy that is used in this process is melphalan. So that was introduced in 1980s. And the high dose melphalan will kill off all the good and bad cells. And, and we hope that during the process, it kills off the bad cells as well. And since you need those good cells for survival, we infuse those stem cells. So it's basically we're giving a high dose chemotherapy to clean off your bone marrow and then infusing those stem cells. So this is basically in a nutshell, the stem cell transplant, autologous stem cell transplant is. So when I tell my patients to understand them better, I tell them it is like a lawn care. So this is a lawn, which has a lot of grants, which is the work you need, but they have a lot of weeds as well, which is like a cancer cells. And you want to kill the weeds off and use them with the initial chemotherapy to get the weeds off. But somehow or the other, the weeds are still there. So what do we do is you kill off those everything, including you clean your, your lawn. And, but you need the grass for your lawn. So you need to have this, the seeds uh, at, uh, at the store. And that is something like a stem cells. So stem cells like nothing but the seeds. And then this, when you kill off this uh, or you clean the marrow, you give the high dose chemotherapy like cleaning your lawn. And since uh, once that is done, you put the seeds back and wait for the counts to come up and same like growing your grass in the lawn. You have to maintain it properly, make sure that you water the, water the lawn and then make sure that they are not infested by the other uh, outside invaders and then make the, uh, the lawn go completely as if, uh, you know, the, and ultimately you want the clean uh, lawn now with the grass, a lot of good grass and no evidence of any other weeds. It's something like the, if conceptually it is something like that, that you are killing off your, your bone marrow uh, cells 
And during the process, you kill off your good cells and both bad cells, and then you get the uh, stem cells back and wait for the counts to come back and ultimately your good counts with the hope that there are no weeds left. Now, so if you look at the, the, the role of stem cell transplant, the autologous stem cell transplant, multiple myeloma remains the most important indication for autologous stem cell transplant. This is the data from CIBMTR, and this is from 2014 data, as you can see on the left-hand side. And the green is for the autologous transplant and the, and the blue is for the allogenic transplant, so which is the transplant from the donor. And multiple myeloma still remains number one indication even now as a, call, as, as, as a modality of the autologous stem cell transplant. And there is after that is a lymphoma. And the trends for the autologous transplant over the years is growing in the case of myeloma. Now, um, having said that, um, it is still remains an underutilized modality of treatment, uh, despite being the very effective treatment, it still remains an underutilized modality, especially in the, in the minorities, uh, the, the, the rate of transplant utilization is about 30%. So that is a lot of work still has to be done because, um, because it is effective therapy and it still remains an underutilized. Now, one of the, the big question that comes to patients and to all of us is, is there still a role of auto autologous transplant in myeloma in the current era? So Dr. Costa showed a beautiful slide of all the new drugs, the combinations and the, and the good responses that we have seen uh, with this introduction of these regimens. But now the, the question that, is, um, that comes up is, do we still need to go for a transplant? And my patients always ask me this question, uh, that uh, is there, it, 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 can we avoid that or do we need to like, uh, is there alternate, alternative treatment that we can do that would get the same benefit of the transplant. And the question, at this, at this point of time, I can say that uh, there is still the role and the transplant still has an important uh, role in controlling a disease and to get the better outcome uh, in the long-term outcome. Now, what is the evidence behind that? So this is the summary of the studies that have been done in the current era uh, the, that try to establish the role of stem cell transplant in the, in the, in the context of novel agents. So, there are a total of five studies. The first two studies are uh, the studies that were done um, in 2014 and 15 that used a uh, revlimid dex induction, um, which is uh, the one that we kind of uh, don't use that frequently now because uh, now as, um, as we, we all know, the triplet induction is the standard of care. And so they, they, in this group, uh, the people, um, the patients were randomized to two transplant back-to-back -back versus the um, uh, conventional drug. And this is the data. So there are two uh, important points that we have to look at. One is called progression-free survival and the other one is overall survival. The progression-free survival means how long your disease remain in remission. And then the overall survival is how long you live, I think, which is the most important endpoint. And as you can see that uh, in both the cases, the progression-free survival, the HDT stands for high dose therapy or uh, the transplant group. And the SDT stands for the standard of care non-transplant group. And as you can see, People who went to high dose therapy group, their progression to survival is 43 months and significantly much higher than the standard uh, therapy group. And similarly, for the overall survival, their overall survival is the four year overall survival. The four year overall survival was also significantly uh, higher. Now, the, the study that is re really relevant to our context in the context of the US is this study by Atal, uh, which is the IFM 2009 study from the French group. They looked at the patients. Uh, another, another question that came up was, can we delay the transplant and can do the transplant after a first relapse? So this, tried to, this study tried to answer the question in the context of the modern therapy. So all in this study, the, people, uh, the patients got RVD induction, about three cycles, and they went to either transplant with melphalan 200 single transplant, or they had just stem cell collected and they went to uh, get the addition cycles of VRD. And as you can see the PFS, so this is the, the, for the early transplant group, the people who went to early transplant, their PFS benefit was 50 months versus 36 months. So significantly different. And the overall survival was about pretty much the same, about 80% in both arms at a four, four year uh, mark. Now, what important to realize is that this in this group, uh, the people who are relapsing at the first relapse, they were mandated to get the transplant at the first relapse. So these people who didn't get the transplant earlier, they went on to get the transplant later on. Now there is a uh, the study just, just recently published is the CAVO is a study from the Italian group. They looked at three things. One, they looked at whether there is benefit of transplant and also if there is benefit of double transplant versus single transplant. Now this is for the whole group. They are also the same thing. The, there, was, uh, there was a progress from survival benefit. That means the, the disease remission um, you know, there is significantly longer time with the transplant uh, group versus the non-transplant group, and the survival was pretty much the same. Now, if you look at this data a little bit more closely, they, when they looked at the double transplant versus single transplant, uh, the overall, um, the people uh, who really benefited are the patients who were in the high-risk group. 
Now, there is another trial that in the US that we did called stamina trial, which I didn't show, which tried to answer the question of single transplant versus double transplant versus single transplant followed by consolidation uh, with the VRD. And that didn't show any, any benefit in three groups. They are all um, uh, same. Um, so the question of tandem transplant or double transplant still remains an open question. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, uh, debate out there still, but, uh, but it is different uh, in the US study and the European study. And lastly, there is a study from the Spanish group called Forte study, which tried to answer the question with the KRD induction. And we know that KRD is a very powerful regimen and a new, newer PI. And they did the KRD induction transplant versus, uh, versus KRD 12 cycles. And what they found out is that for the KRD um, transplant group, uh, what is significant to know is that the risk of early progression uh, means the people who are progressing in 18 months after transplant, the risk is significantly much lower in the transplant group, about 8% versus 17%. So what all this data suggests is that the transplant, early transplant or the transplant in myeloma helps you to achieve a longer and deeper remission. And if you want to achieve the first remission, which is the best remission, longer, then probably transplant is the best strategy. Now, in all these studies, uh, except for the Forte study, we don't have the data. All these studies, the patients who are not in the transplant group, when they relapsed and the first time, most of them went to get a transplant at a, at a, as a salvage uh, therapy. For example, in Atal group, in Atal study, which is uh, the IFM study that they mandated the patient who were, uh, were going to relapse or the first relapse to get a transplant, 79% of the patients went to get the transplant. Now, that's the reason probably the survival is same. But what it highlights most important point is that if you want to get a transplant at a later, later time or after first relapse, not all of the patients will be able to get a transplant. As you can see, they were mandated to get a transplant, all of them at the first relapse, but only 80%, less than 80% of them were able to get a transplant. And more than 20% of the patients were not able to get a transplant because of a number of reasons. One could be disease became very aggressive, but more aggressive than, they went, uh, than when it came back. Number two is uh, the patients probably were much older or the patients were sicker with other comorbidities. So it is important based on this data that even in the context of the modern therapy, I think uh, to get a best remission and also longer remission, probably transplant is the best strategy as a backbone uh, in these eligible patients. Now, so um, Dr. Costa mentioned about the, the achievement of the minimal residual disease status, negative uh, MRD status, uh, and that translate, translate into uh, better outcomes with the therapy. Now, all these studies, uh, um, the, the recent studies, particularly the IFM study and the, 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 the other, the Forte study looked at the MRD level after transplant. So this is the subset analysis of the IFM study where the people got the RVD arm um, and, the, and or the transplant, uh, transplant arm. And this is the MRD level measured, measured by um, the, the next-gen sequencing, which is the, the FDA-approved assay. And you can see there is a significant difference in the level of MRD negativity achievement with the transplant modality, about 30% uh, versus 20%. So there is about 10% difference in the, uh, the MRD difference, MRD negativity difference in the, with the transplant arm. So that, that established that the, the, the transplant can achieve a deep responses. Now on the right-hand side of the curve, you can see that the people do the same, whether the standard risk or high risk, if they achieve the um, MRD negativity. So one of the questions that, that people sometimes ask me is that, do we really need to transplant MRD negativity? Now here, the study is not designed to answer that, but more importantly, what we have to rely on is that if you do a transplant, the chance of you achieving MRD negativity is much higher than getting uh, not doing a transplant. So based on that also, if you want to achieve deep and longer remission, um, at this point of time, transplant still remains the, uh, the important modality. Now, what about the quality of life? People, uh, you know, kind of uh, worried about uh, when you describe, when you, when you talk to them about um, the post, post tra transplant course, staying in the hospital for two weeks, and then, you know, your immune system going down. People always ask about the quality of life. Unfortunately, uh, there is no any uh, prospective data looking at the quality of life in the um, current setting. So this is the study uh, that was done before we had this novel agents and all those stuff in 1998. And they looked at one of the endpoints called TWIST. TWIST stands for treatment uh, time without symptoms, treatment and treatment toxicity. So if you look at this, uh, the people who went early transplant. So this is the study that was, design, that was done to look at uh, the benefit of early versus delayed transplant in the pre novel agent era. And when they looked at that endpoint, they found that people who went early transplant, their TWIST, or the time without symptoms, treatment and treatment toxicity was much longer, significantly much longer than the people who went to delayed transplant. So if we extrapolate that data, 
I mean, it is possible that the patients who are um, going to early transplant because they are younger, they're probably fitter, and they have probably less comorbidities than delayed uh, time, uh, it is possible that they would have a better quality of life. And based on our clinical experience, I can tell you that you know, the, the, the rough time is the first first two weeks after transplant. After they recover from the transplant, given the fact that they can they don't need to be on a lot of treatment, um, you know, the, just a uh, just a little bit of maintenance treatment, their quality of life um, has you know, based on our experience, is much better than that. But uh, if you look at the study, there is not much of a prospective study, and that is needed at this time uh, to kind of uh, uh, to answer that question. Now, who are the candidates for an autologous stem cell transplant? So if you, the, the study that I um, showed to you, all the five studies, um, they, they are European studies and uh, they looked at the patients, the age limit was about 65 uh, years of age. Uh, as we know that uh, myeloma is a disease, uh, median age is about 65 plus. So about two, th two thirds of the patients are uh, not represented in that group. Uh, but we have a lot of real world, world evidence that um, patients uh, 65 plus and even older patients can derive the benefit of the stem cell transplant. So I can tell you from our experience, we have transplanted patients up to 80 years, uh, 80 years of age as well. So age is not a limitation. What is important is how functional and how fit the patient is. As long as there is no prohibited, prohibitive comorbidities, that means if the lung and heart is doing okay, patient is fit enough, uh, fit enough their performance status is uh, good enough to allow, then we will usually take them to transplant. And the patients should have adequate stem cell collection. Minimum is around 2 million uh, in most of the centers. And, and it is, in general, it's a very safe modality. And uh, the data that I showed to you, and uh, the, uh, there are a few of the two of the studies reported the transplant related mortality or the risk of dying uh, just because you went to transplant, the risk was less than 1%. So this is the national average. But if you look at the center specific, you know, that is much less than that. So it is much safer modality even, um, and then so, and then it's pretty um, effective modality. So uh, that's why we kind of encourage the patients who are transplant eligible to go to this, um, this treatment um, process. Now, what are the complications? Some of the complications that I think were worth um, knowing is uh, that to divide into two, one is the immediate and early complications, and the other one is the late complications. Most of the complications that patients usually face is the immediate and early complications. The immediate complications could be related to the stem cell infusion, uh, you know, uh, reaction to the stem cell, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the preservative, or sometimes flushing, uh, nausea, vomiting can happen. They are very rare. Mainly the complications happen during the early period when the patients don't have enough, uh, you know, blood cells um, uh, that can uh, result in the mucositis, result in uh, potential of infections. Uh, though we do all the, uh, you know, preventive antibiotics, prophylactic antibiotics for, uh, to, for, for uh, that during the time. And uh, sometimes during the time when the counts are coming, uh, coming up, you can also see uh, uh, the, some of the symptoms patient experience uh, with the diarrhea and fever. Uh, we call this engraftment syndrome, but this is very easily treatable with the steroids. And the late complications are sometimes uh, some of the patients may not get uh, engraftment or especially the pedal engraftment can be late. Infections can still be at uh, risk because your immune system may not have matured right away. And so we put them in some uh, prophylactic antifungal, um, I'm sorry, prophylactic antibacterial and antiviral medications. And the late uh, complications include uh, the risk of second cancers. So uh, the risk of second cancers in people who went to transplant versus those who didn't go to transplant is slightly higher. And also sometimes uh, the infection risk is, uh, can, can be there because of the uh, hypogamma globulinemia or the low immunoglobin level. But if you look at all this risk and the benefits, the benefits definitely outweigh the risk. Um, and so, um, so it's better, uh, you know, we, we kind of recommend uh, going for this modality, um, you know, for, for this disease. And uh, one of the questions that always uh, come to, uh, in the last few, two months and now is, uh, do we do transplant in the current setting when the COVID-19 outbreak? Now, uh, as I uh, said before, in our center, we didn't do a transplant in the month of April, but, um, uh, but, not it, uh, but now we have started that. So this is some of the guidelines that is out there and I just uh, got, got it and it was probably is applicable in most of the setting. And uh, the standard risk myeloma, you know, you, uh, you might consider, um, you know, by delaying the transplant, especially, uh, you know, in the outbreak, depending on the, 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 the center and depending on the reason and how much surge is there and all those stuff, uh, you might consider delaying the transplant by adding one or two cycles of uh, induction treatment and also you can delay the collection. Uh, but in high risk myeloma, I think, uh, you know, because a lot of uh, studies uh, have shown that there is a benefit of the uh, transplant in a high risk setting, particularly somebody with a 70p deletion. So I think it is recommended to proceed with the transplant and uh, we uh, make sure that uh, we test for the SARS uh, infection 
um, before the transplant and uh, make sure they are not uh, infected and uh, take them to transplant. Uh, this probably would change uh, even for the standard risk setting and uh, you know going forward uh, because now we know how to um, you know do the appropriate precautions and uh, then we are kind of more experienced in um, in managing these patients now so uh, so in conclusion um, uh, despite the development of a lot of effect effective therapies and regimens um, auto transplant remains the preferred therapy for eligible patients it is associated, associated with significant PFS benefit or progression free survival benefit. And if you, um, uh, you know, definitely associated OS benefit if you don't do transplant, even for the early versus delayed transplant, maybe associated with the, long, uh, with the OS benefit if you follow them up longer time, because we have a lot of effective therapies uh, once the patient relapses, and that might have um, neg in, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, negated the benefit of the overall survival benefit of the transplant. But we for sure know that it is associated with deeper responses, including the MRD negativity. And we all know the achievement, the first remission and the long rem and the, is the best remission. And then also the, uh, the long remission, the first remission is always important. So with the, for that, uh, transplant remains an important um, uh, modality. And the toxicities and the death associated with procedures are very minimal. The, the overall mortality rate uh, with the transplant is less than 1%. And it may also be associated with improved quality of life, though we still don't have the data in the current setting. But, uh, but uh, based on our clinical experience, I can tell you that uh, this may be associated with improved quality of life.